Hey, Abide family, it's Pastor Chris here. I hope that you're doing well, and wherever you're joining us from today, whether it's your home, whether it's a friend's house or a coffee shop or whatever, um, I pray that you're staying safe and warm. Now, um, we wanted to continue last week's message on Faith Forward, dealing with matters of our faith, coming from Luke chapter 18. Uh, I told you last Sunday that there were two parts we wanted to focus on, and we only covered one part. Praise God. So here I am today, and we are going to cover the second part of that scripture in Luke 18. And I believe it still comes along with Uh, the word that the Lord gave me where he said he's taking us around the mountain again, meaning that there's still something we can see, something we can learn, something we need to do. And I, I just am so thankful that in his great love, he allows us this opportunity to learn again with him. It's not always a bad thing to go around the mountain. Sometimes we need to go around the mountain so that we get it right. And so that is what we are going to do today. We will continue the topic of faith, but today our message is titled Fervent. So someone type fervent in the comments. I would also ask that if you're brand new today and you've never joined us online, would you just tell us where you're from? Uh, we, we pray that you're blessed. If there's anything we can do to join with you in prayer, uh, please let us know. You can message us, all of those things. But I just pray that you guys will um, blow up the chat a little bit, okay? And, and, and I mean that in a good way. So uh, comment back and forth. Uh, amen when something's really ministering to you. Type it out in the notes. Uh, Uh, Our notes are available on our website, www.abideokc.com. They're also available in our Abide app. You can find that in the Apple and Google Play stores. And so um, a lot of these links, uh, they'll be posted throughout the um, uh, live stream as well as giving links. Yes, even though we are not physically meeting, you can still give. You can still choose to partner with the ministry at Abide, whether it's uh, ministering to homeless and and providing with our food pantries, whether it's uh, furthering our missions, uh, whether it's partnering with our other ministries and churches and conferences that meet here, all of those things need you. And I pray that uh, you can partner with us, sow a seed, believe God to do something awesome through those gifts. Pray into it. Say, God, I want to see this happen as you give. Amen. Test your faith and give above and beyond what maybe is safe or what you've given in the past. And so I I pray that that encourages you. Once again, those links will be posted. I'm going to go ahead and pray. And then we're going to dive into our message today. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the opportunity to come before you in worship and prayer and and Lord, study of your word. I know that you've given us this word for now, Lord. You're taking us around the mountain again. And I'm so thankful that you hold us by the hand. Some, Some of us you carry, Lord God, so that we can make it together with you. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for all you're doing and all you've yet to do in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that that blesses you. As I mentioned, last week we began in Luke chapter 18. Before I post the scripture and have you read along with me, I'm going to do something that we often do, um, and I pray it's a blessing to you. Sometimes we can go a little bit fast, we preachers, and you might miss a scripture. You may not know where to find our online notes, and so I've got a slide made just for you that my team is going to put up right now. And it's going to be our scriptures list. And so if you are wanting to follow along, just take a screenshot of your screen right now or pause it and and write them down, whatever you'd like to do. But here are the scriptures that we will cover in the message today. Once again, if you're not uh, taking notes on your phone or maybe things are too difficult right now, you can view us in our church app. And in the church app, when you click on the message fervent, you can actually click on sermon notes and get my entire setup of notes that we're going to have today, as well as any other messages. So now that you have the scriptures list, uh, and I pray that's a blessing to you. As I mentioned last week, we talked about a few things and I want to recap this real quick. And so one of the things that ministered to me, I pray that it ministered to you, uh, was that the scripture in Isaiah 6 where Isaiah is present amongst the the courts of heaven. And he overhears the Lord God say, who will go for us? Who can we send out to tell this people? 
And he wasn't addressing Isaiah directly, but Isaiah was there. And as his mouth had the coal touch his mouth, and he was a man of unclean lips, is what he said, that he was going to die in the presence of God, the angel ministered to him, cleansed him. And Isaiah heard this question from the Trinity, and he said, Here I am, Lord, send me. And that that scripture or that that wordage, that phrase that he used meant a couple things in the original Hebrew. First, and I and I love this, it was before you even asked, my answer was yes. Powerful. Let our hearts be that way. But the second that I thought was equally as powerful, and I can message the Strong's numbers uh, for you uh, in the chat, but equally as powerful, the the connotation that he's saying, send me, it said in the Hebrew, it meant as to throw or to hurl like a spear. And so I shared with uh, the church here, uh, if you were here last Sunday, you might remember this, but I, I mentioned that it reminded me of Lord of the Rings, where Gimli and Aragorn were on the bridge and, and everybody was about to be overtaken and they were kind of on the side. And he said something that he previously said he wouldn't do or that shouldn't happen to dwarves uh, because this is a, a fictional tale. They're, they're like other creatures. And so he was a dwarf, a small man, and he said, toss me. And it was that idea of Aragorn, the king, the true king, picking him up, throwing him at the enemy, hurling him at the enemy. And he's like, I may be small. I may not be able to do a whole lot, but I guarantee you, if you throw me and he had this big old battle axe in his hand, he's like, I'm confident I can do some damage. That's how we need to be as it pertains to our faith and going for God is like, I may not be able to do much, but in your hand, oh God, I can do a lot because I trust that you, you're the one that's going to throw me. You're the one that's going to sustain me and we're going to do some damage to the enemy. So are you a spear in the hand of the Lord? So that was part one. And as we focused on this, remember the text that we were drawing from, Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. And it was the persistent widow that when she went to the unjust judge, we're going to read it in a second, but she continued to persist. She continued to ask. And the question that the Lord asked me that I, I asked our church and I wanted us to really think on, and I pray you've had time to do that, was the last statement that Jesus made is he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When Jesus comes back, will he find people of faith? Will he find, um, similar to what we read in the parable of the ten virgins, will he find virgins that have prepared themselves, that trimmed their lamps, that have their oil ready, that are ready to do what the master has called us to do. And we haven't been lazy. We haven't been just sitting around waiting, but we've been waiting for him while being active with our faith. We've been persistent in our faith. And, and so we focused on that question last week. And this week, I want us to focus on the first part or, or the, the earlier part of of Luke 18, 1 through 8. So let's let's read that today, and, and we're going to start into this, that fervency. In Luke 18, 1 through 8, it says, and I'm reading in the New International, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Now listen, uh, before we, we unpack the last couple verses here, this is the, the part that we're going to focus on today. It's that fervency. It's that persistence. It's the perseverance that she had to continue to ask, knowing that although he was an evil judge and he didn't care what people th thought, I'm sure his reputation preceded him. Nonetheless, she knew that he was the only one that could get her justice from her adversary, and so she persisted in asking, okay? So she worked it out. Now, at the same time, think about her ask. Her ask was a good request. 
But he didn't answer it because of her request. He didn't answer it because it's like, yeah, that's the right thing to do. He answered it because of her persistence, because he knew that she would continue to persist. And even though we don't see this kind of character in this woman, he assumed she would eventually come and attack him. So uh, he kind of got scared. It was that persistence that was fiery, is that persistence that that had something to it. It wasn't just asking and asking and asking and being annoying. It was a fieriness that she had that this man believed that if she would continue to come, he might be attacked, okay? Then we say, see in the last few verses once again, and the Lord said, this is Jesus, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Some of us need to hear that today. You've been asking, you've been asking, you've been asking. And this is not a parable to show that, hey, we need to just keep asking God. Uh, he, he's just so, um, I don't know, uh, just busy that if we keep asking him, he'll, he'll eventually get. I, I actually was told that for a number of years. You just got to keep asking God, keep asking God until he just gets tired of it. The scriptures tell us actually contrary to that idea is that, you know, our father doesn't want to give us good gifts. But in Matthew 7, 11, it actually says that he does want to give us good gifts because he is a good, good father. Some of y'all are thinking about the song. Go ahead and sing it. No judgment. He is a good, good father, but he also wants to give us good gifts. And so one of the things I wanted to highlight here in, in this persistence is um, that she continued to ask but I think it was more about the working out of her faith, the working out of her belief, the working out of that she knew that she would get justice. And so um, let me let me say it this way. Our, our persistence is less on, quote unquote, bothering God, making him answer us, wearing him down. And I think it's more about uh, growing in Christian character, trusting that he is good and he will do what he says that his time is not our time. And that doesn't mean that he's not listening to us, but that just means that we're not walking or we're not, um, I guess, aligned with heaven's timetable. And that would cause us to say, Holy Spirit, bend my heart so that I fall in line with your cadence. Like when you say go, I go. When you say stop and rest, I stop and rest. Um, the other thing that I was going to say that uh, it shows us is uh, a persistence in resisting the devil as well as our fleshly desires. Our flesh wants things that don't always align with the Spirit of God, and we have to work persistently to crucify our flesh so that we're not in direct opposition to God. No one wants to be that. I want to be a spear in the hand of the Lord. I don't want to be on the receiving end of that spear. Are you with me? And so, you know, we want to persist in crucifying our flesh, making it subject and obedient to God. We're going to show some scriptures here where Paul talks about that, um, as well as resisting the devil. We see in scripture, resist the devil and he will flee from you as we submit to God, right? And so that's that, that's that persistence in pushing down our desires, especially when they don't align with God's, okay? That doesn't mean that God doesn't want to bless you. That doesn't mean that you won't gain the desires of your heart. But I guarantee it's so much better, and I believe, I could say this, swifter when they align with his. Another scripture I wanted to read real quick before we get too far was found in James chapter 5 and 16, and it says in the King James, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And remember, I told you, as we uh, practiced this out last Sunday, we confessed our sins, not only to God, but to each other. Sometimes we, we miss that. We we looked at the way the old church did it, and we we're like, ah, we don't need none of that. I, I, I talk to Jesus and Jesus alone. Well, good for you. I, we do too. But what this says is we should confess our faults one to another. One version said continually confess your faults one to another. Amen? And so that means it didn't stop. And that means that it wasn't enough for us just to bring it to God. Sometimes we bring it to each other so that we could be healed. Amen? And then it said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. Uh, one version, I think it was the message, says has great power as it is working. 
man, I don't want none of those. Feel good. Oh, bless them. I'll protect them. Oh, Lord, you know, this, that, the other. I want somebody who's crying out, who's travailing, who's persisting in prayer for me, just as I want to persist in prayer for them. We're not going to be winning any wars if we're throwing darts at the enemy. We need to be throwing javelins. Y'all listen to that? Throwing spears with the sharpest points of all time on it. And we need to be lobbing those things continuously. The enemy is not phased by our, our sweet little prayers. The enemy is phased when we quote scripture and we actually live it out and believe what we're saying. He knows the scripture too, and he knows God, and he, it, it causes him to fear and tremble. God is the one that runs him off, not me or you and our fancy words. Say what scripture says, believe what scripture says, and then do it. Amen? <clears throat> and so, as we're continuing on, um, I, I really want us to press, and we're going to focus today, the rest of the scriptures, the rest of our discussion on the persistence. Now, I wanted to to call something out um, before we get t- too far, and it's in a different set of my notes, and, and I hope that's okay today. I've got some uh, digital notes I typed up, but I've got some paper notes that I wrote out, and I've got some scripture, scripture references for you that I did not uh, reference, and I hope this is okay. But I want us, and, and I believe the Spirit wants us to be like Paul. And so Paul was able to say, to Timothy, his true son in the faith, in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, he says, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, I have fought the good fight, right? He realized that what was going on was real, and he wanted to be able to he- say that he ran to win, okay? And we're going to we're gonna give you a scripture on that. That's 1 Corinthians 9 and 27, but he, he ran to win. He didn't just enter a race uh, for a participation trophy. And uh, I know this is speaking to somebody. Forgive me. I love you. I love little Johnny. I'm glad little Johnny participated. But what I'm talking about is not just participating. I'm talking about entering to win, that he wanted the fullness of God's promise. He didn't just want to say, all right, I got salvation. All right, I got Jesus. I'm good. He wanted to settle for all of God's promises. He wanted to get all of that because of the way that he lived, the way that he loved God. And and one of the, the elements of that that we're going to talk about in, in a few moments is the fact that um, a lot of people look at Ephesians 2 and they quote, for we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. And, and they miss the fact that Paul wasn't saying that we shouldn't do good works. And, and we're going to unpack that here in a second. So I'll maybe make a note of that. But he, we were saved by grace through faith to do good works. And we're going to see that not only in Paul's writings, but in James's writings. And so Paul lived this because he was saved. He knew that that would produce good works in him to serve the father. And I'm going to show you that. But before we move on too far, um, <clears throat> the persistent mindset that we need to walk out uh, God's promises in our lives towards us and to re- resist the devil so that he would flee from us. James 4, 7. Galatians 6, 9, it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. How often, how many of us have quit the task that the Lord has called us to only inches or minutes away from the finish line of our blessing? What do you mean, Chris? That we've we've been doing good or we've been going so fast and so um, much that we we become weary, we become tired. We we're not asking for help like we should. We're not um, leaning on others like we should. We're not leaning on the Lord like we should, and it's caused us to burn out and to lose steam and to lay our weapons down right at the brink of victory. And, and God is saying, "I've got so much more for you." Yes, you may be experiencing the benefits of being His, but I'm talking about your harvest that comes from a specific seed. I don't know if you know this or not, but you have been given a specific seed that I don't have. And he's asked you to scatter that seed and to do what he's called you to do with it. And and obviously we're to trust that he'll send waterers, he'll send nurturers, he'll send harvesters. He takes care of that. But we each have a task that is set before us. And as I mentioned last week, it's, it's like we're waiting or we're looking around at somebody else to do it for us. 
And we're the ones that got that word. We're the ones that were told to do that thing, to scatter that seed. And we're not doing it. We're expecting someone else to do it. And I believe that God can bring other people. He can finish it in another way, but he's asking us to do it. So why won't we be faithful to partner with him and to see it through? Don't quit on the brink of your victory, on the brink of reaping that harvest, because he said at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you, person on the other line of this online feed, do not give up. You're almost there. Keep going. Don't grow weary. I pray a special uh, just spirit of strength to come upon you right now from the hand of the Lord, that as you are faithful in going, you'll be faithful to complete it. Amen? The other thing I wanted to remind you of is that it's so important to continue to be students of Scripture. And what I mean by that is that we open up the Word and we realize that, man, I might have read this passage a dozen times or more, but I always go to the Word and say, Holy Spirit, your Word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I believe that you are my teacher. You're the best teacher. Would you teach me your Word now? Would you help me to see something I've never seen before? Or would you help me to apply something you've been teaching me that I haven't applied to my life, right? It's being a constant student. I pray that you're always learning and then you ask him to apply the word to your heart. But a beautiful cross-reference to um, actually Luke uh, 18 verse 5 is found in 1 Corinthians. And I've been using this language a little bit um, pertaining to a race and pertaining to finishing our race. But look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 starting at verse 24, and I'm reading this in the uh, Christian Standard Bible today. It says, Don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. I want to pause there. We'll keep this up. All of you are running, but only one receives the prize. Now, thankfully, us in Jesus, Jesus won the prize, and we all are going to receive a prize as we are faithful to do what he's called us to do. Amen? And so, a little little unique there. (coughs) But what Paul is saying, you should run to receive a prize. Listen, verse 25, now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. That hits somebody. If you compete, you're going to have to exercise self-control in everything. Remember what I said, that persistence in killing the flesh so that your spirit man can grow and rise. And listen, he's talking about the world here. They do it to receive a perishable crown or a perishable trophy, something that does not persist. It, it withers and fades, right? It gets rusty. But we do it to receive an imperishable crown. The riches in glory that we will receive through Christ Jesus being joint heirs with him will persist throughout all of eternity. That's what he's talking about. Verse 26. So I do not run like one who runs aimlessly and I do not box like one just beating the air. Like, I I just love this. Paul is like, you know, man, I, I am training. I'm getting ready. Listen, verse 27. Instead, I discipline my body and I bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Teachers, listen up right now. If you're a teacher, if you're a preacher, if you're someone, eh, let me, let me requalify this, you know, people of God, because someone's watching you, someone's learning from you. Have you been in a situation or have you been in a process of disciplining your body making it obedient to Christ, bringing it under strict control, so that when preaching, teaching, leading others, you will not find yourself disqualified. Do you live what you say? Do you practice what you preach? Has the word made it from here to here? Has it made it from head to heart? Are you living it? That's going to be the best teacher. That's going to have the most impact. That's going to transform the most lives. And I'm telling you, all of us are called to preach. All of us are a witness. And so you may say, but I'm, I'm not teaching like Pastor Chris. He, he better be the one that's living that. No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying the word of God is telling you that someone is watching. Someone is listening. And so is your body, is your lifestyle, are your habits under his control, submitted to his authority, so that you are not disqualified from this race. Amen? Another 
two thoughts on persistence and, and I didn't pull them into my notes here. And so I may read these from the side, but I thought of two instances and I also thought it was beautiful that the Lord often uses widows in scripture. He remembered the widow who gave her two mites and he taught about giving and sacrificial giving. We, we had the widow here that was, uh, is our main point of focus about persistence. Then I thought of two more widows. I, I thought about Elijah and the widow of Zarephath where she had this little bit of flour and her plan was that she was so done. She was, she was ready to have her last meal and die. And instead, Elijah asked her to make him something to eat. And she found, um, it's, it's actually in um, 1 Kings 17. And um, let me see, 1 Kings 17. And it started in verse 13. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. This woman was at her, at her end. She was ready to die. But he said, hey, before you die. And I thought that was a little bit of a low jab if you were kind of paying attention to scripture. He's like, oh, go ahead and do what you said. Eat that last meal. But before you do that, make me something, right? But she still had to walk in faith. Hey, this guy thinks that I can just go home, use what little I have to to eat my final meal with me and my son, but he wants me to make it for him. And then he said that it will not be used up. That oil and that flour won't run dry until the Lord brings rain back in the land because there had been a drought, right? And it happened that way. Amen. And so, so that was one widow, one additional widow that I thought of that had to exercise faith, that had to exercise a perseverance in, in the face of great odds or great things stacked against her. Then we have another widow, and this is found in uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 4. And, and I don't know if Elijah uh, told all this to Elisha, the, the one who came after him and took up his mantle and started doing these things and was kind of a, a spiritual son to him. But I don't know if he talked about the widow with the jar of oil, but Elisha meets a widow and, and it's in, um, once again, 2 Kings ver, uh, chapter 4. And, and it starts out right at the beginning. Her husband died. She owes this great debt and the creditor is coming to take her two boys as his slaves. And so Elisha says, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And the lady says, I've got nothing at all. And then she continued, except a small jar of olive oil. Amen. And Elisha says, go around and ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Don't just ask for a little bit. He said, then go inside, shut your door behind you and your sons, pour oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Listen, she had, All I got is this jar of oil. This is all I got. And he said, That's enough. Do you believe that God will use that? If you believe that God will use that, go gather up some vessels. Go gather up some jars and start pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and keep pouring. And and y'all listen, not only was she able to pay off the debt, and I'm assuming this was a great debt because he was wanting to take two sons and they were going to be servants to this guy. But she was able to not only pay off the debt, but her and her two sons were able to live on what was left. Amen? Amen. So imagine if she would have grabbed more vessels, more jars. Are we exercising a faith that perseveres, a faith that looks at the enemy and says, you're already dead. You've already lost the battle, the war, everything. Jesus's victory has triumphed over death, hell, and the grave, and all your little scheming. And I'm going to put my trust in him and him alone. I'm going to crucify my flesh. I'm going to tell you to shut up and go where you belong, right? 
so that I can do what God wants me to do and he will take care of me. Y'all listen, just as God took care of these widows that we've talked about in scripture so far, he also took care of the people of Israel. Not only were, did they have uh, manna and, and, and y'all listen, uh, I, I'm, I'm still curious to check this stuff out because, um, you know, it's like, you know, they didn't even have a word for it. They're like, what is it? You know, manna, what is it? But when they got tired of manna, he said, you know what? I'll do you one better. I'll bring quail. I've talked to a few of my Bible scholar friends, and this was not no little amount of quail. This was a ton of birds, y'all. A ton of quail. They had chicken nuggets for days and days, okay? And the thing that I thought was so cool about it is not only did God provide enough for every single family, every single mouth for days, and, and how cool is it for God? So the adults are like, Oh, we're just eating this manna. All right, little Johnny, eat your manna. And little Johnny's like, I want chicken nuggets. And God's like, all right, here's chicken nuggets. Let's go. And so you got chicken nuggets and manna, and God knew enough. Now, we also know that little Johnny, you know, he kind of chews on one nugget and puts it back. You know, everyone was well fed. Everyone was taken care of. And the only time things went kind of crazy is when they tried to gather more than they were supposed to because they had that uh, poverty mentality that said, I don't know if it's going to be here tomorrow. I don't know if God's good. I don't know if I can trust him. I'm going to gather some for now. And then they'd go in and find that was rotting. He said, don't do that. Trust me to provide all that you need day after day. And then he said, on the Sabbath, in order to prepare for the Sabbath, not only can I provide enough for you today, I'll know exactly what you need for the next day on Sabbath where you're not going to come out here and go searching for all this. I'm going to make sure that you can gather enough to provide for today and then some, okay? And so God knew even that. Little, little Johnny had his chicken nuggets and you had your manna or both, amen? All right. Now, I find this scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, 23. I love a few of these in the Passion Translation. Uh, that is what TPT is. And so if you're not familiar with it, um, I, I like to um, diversify when I'm studying and, and even when we're preaching sometimes and bringing some additional uh, translations in just to further unpack the meaning and to help us see something that maybe we didn't see before in a translation that we're familiar with. I have found that sometimes that if I'm reading and I know it so well that I can recount it, that I sometimes can forget to ask the Lord what that meaning was. And so when I read a different translation, it causes me to look and look again, like, what did I just say what I thought it said? And so um, Hebrews 10, 23, check this out, in the Passion says, So now we must cling tightly to the hope that lives within us, knowing that God always keeps his promises. Someone needs to say that God always always keeps his promises in the chat. And so if we believe that God always keeps his promises, that we're not coming to him like this woman did with the evil judge, pestering and pestering and pestering and pestering, hoping that he will answer our request. We know that he will. And so I, I would dare say that sometimes our persistence is so that we align with his promises. And we believe that he's good. We believe that he's able. We believe that he's willing to do what we've asked. And so I think it's more about convincing us to walk in alignment with the Holy Spirit than convincing him to do what we need. He already knows what we need. Amen. And so here's a question that I have for you. If we desire a faith that prevails over the works of the enemy, then we must believe the words of Jesus. Are you speaking life? And I'm going to give you an example of this and, and something I've been processing all week long. And so last week, um, I, I mentioned to you um, that we we believe in miraculous healing. We believe in not only miracles, but we also believe in the gifts of healing. And those things could happen instantaneously, immediate, you know, eyes growing back, ears growing back, limbs growing back. We believe in those things, but we also believe in an ever increasing health. And something that we did at prayer night last week on Friday, Friday nights are prayer nights at 6 p.m. And uh, we prayed and we made some declarations. And one of the declarations that's been resonating in me, because uh, last week I, I mentioned that I had some pain um, and I couldn't really walk, couldn't, you know, bend over and do all that. It was, it was what I thought was muscular pain, but so much more that I won't get into. But I believe that I would be healed. Praise God I am. But one of the things that I uh, declared based on scripture was that, uh, and we did this together in prayer, is we said, I walk and, and, and live in 
an ever-increasing health, that my body is ever-increasing in health, that that sickness doesn't attack me the way that it, that it does or the way that it did in my old life because now I'm Christ. And if I walk in an ever-increasing measure of health, then that means that the things that normally would have come against me he defends me. He protects me. He heals me. And and something that you need to hear on this, and I'm just being real with you, and I hope I can be real with you, and you don't think any less of me because I'm human. I need Jesus too. But constantly the, the devil has been ridiculing me all week long because my, my kiddos got sick. Um, a few of us got the sniffles. A few of us got a, you know, a, a bug, and, and we're coughing and hacking and doing all that. And he said, oh, you walk in ever-increasing health, huh? And I, I kind of felt like Job, he, where he you know, goes to the Lord and says, does, does he fear you for no reason? Does he honor you for no reason? Take your protection away from him. Remove your hand of blessing from him, and he'll curse you to his face. And you know what I did the moment that God revealed that to me in my heart? is instead of thinking about all the ways that I feel terrible, all the ways that I'm tired and I've got no energy and I don't feel good in the natural, I praised God. I praise God anyway. I said, I do walk in ever-increasing health. And I will praise the Lord, even when I'm, in in my opinion, from, from a sight, you know, what my eyes can see, what my mind can feel, my emotions think, all of that. Even when I don't think that I'm living in that divine health, I'm going to praise God. Even when I don't think I've been fully blessed, I'm not walking in the blessing that I think I should walk in, I'm going to praise God because the devil wants to beat us up. He wants to get us in those pity parties and those wine fests, right? That way we complain and blame God. But like Job, that we can praise God, that maybe we question things, and, and y'all better believe I was questioning things. And, and, and also, man, everybody's going to think he's fake. He's saying that he believes in healing, and here he is, he's sick. His family's sick, blah, 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 blah. But I believe that God is bigger than me, He's bigger than my words. He's bigger than, you know, the, these messages that I preach. And, and I trust him. And so the devil said, do you walk in ever increasing health? I was like, you better believe it. And I know where you're going. I, I know I know the end of your story and I know the end of my story. And guess what? Mine's better than yours. So say all that you want, but I'm not listening because my God is greater. Amen. And so I'm telling you, it's in these moments. It's where the rubber meets the road. Will you continue to trust God? Will you continue to believe what he says about you and for you and to you and walk in that? Or will we only look at our circumstances? I'm encouraging you to persist and press forward. Now, one of the the last few things that we're going to talk about is um, we all need to examine ourselves. And I'm going to show you where scripture points us at in this. And the fact that not only will we know, but the world will know that we're Jesus's disciples because we bear much fruit and we have love for one another. And one of the things that I shared with the church a while back, and I'm going to have a couple of these in the Passion, um, but in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, when we talk about the fruit, it's singular. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And in that love, that love fruit, there's expressions that flow from the fruit of Holy Spirit, and they manifest in different ways. And I'm going to unpack that. And I just want to kind of reveal that to you because most of us have quoted all our lives love joy peace patience kindness goodness gentleness you know and you know we kind of rattle it all off and they're like all oh, these fruits and no, it said fruit singular okay so we'll, we'll, we'll unpack that in just a second but um second corinthians 13 5 says examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith test yourselves do you not realize that christ jesus is in you unless of course you fail the test is Jesus in you? Are you examining yourselves? Uh, when you look at your life, is there fruit? Is there praise? Is there love? Is there worship? Okay. Now here's the Galatian scripture I was talking about. It's in the Passion, and and he breaks it down um, according to the original language. And so look at Galatians five twenty two and twenty three. But the fruit, singular, produced by the Holy Spirit within you, is divine love love in all its varied expressions. So look at this. And I love the way he unpacked this. This is neither here nor there, but I believe if you have these expressions flowing in your life, your Jesus is okay. Joy that overflows peace that subdues. Like, does it bring everything, all the storms of your life calm in the midst of the peace that you experience with Holy Spirit? 
patience that endures. I've heard so many people all my life say, y'all don't pray for patience. You pray for patience. God's going to give you an opportunity to be patient and you don't want that. No, actually I do. I want patience. I want to learn what it means to exercise his patience. Um, I have to share this story and and hopefully my dad will forgive me. But I remember my mom talking about his heart surgery, his open heart surgery that he had a few years ago. And she said that um, they gave him some really heavy uh, medication to, you know, numb the pain and deal with all of that. And (coughs) excuse me, she said that um, she wasn't prepared for what was going to come out of him. Um, mom and us. And and as you can imagine, when you know somebody for so long, you know the old version of them as well as the new version. What I mean by that is uh, my dad was saved in later years. And so she was worried that, hey, when he's kind of drugged up a little bit in a lot of pain, maybe some bad words might come out of his mouth and he he might not look or sound very great as a believer. But actually, um, the opposite happened, right? Because my father was saved she said he was the most sweetest, blessed man. She was like, he was so nice to all of the, the, the men and women nurses, all the people that would help him. She just said he was just such a joy to be around it. And, and, uh, she wasn't knocking on him too bad. She was like, can you do that a little bit more at the house? You know, just be, you know, a, a little nice like that, a little sweetie like that. But, um, uh, I'm just kind of picking on him cause he, he is great. He is um, a man of God that you would want to follow. Like, like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But I find that that's beautiful because it said, the word of God says that out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we store in our heart the good things of God, when pressure and storms and things come against us, that's what comes out. And I pray that our lives are that way. I was like, man, Lord Jesus, if I ever get put under heavy medication for a big surgery, I pray that I'm blessing somebody and not cursing somebody. You know what I'm saying? Amen. So, um, so that's, that's my dad. So the next time you see him, just, (laughs) you know, bless him in that. But, um, patience that endures kindness in action that you don't just say kind things that you live kindness, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails. There it is. Does your faith, is your faith the kind that prevails? It is if Holy Spirit lives in you because he's cultivating that. Gentleness of heart. And then finally, strength of spirit. Never set the law above these qualities because they are meant to be limitless. Why? Because Holy Spirit is limitless. He has access to all of it. All the gifts belong to him. And he can use those and infuse those in us and through us as we bless God's people. So they are meant to to be limitless. So God, can I have more peace? Can I have more joy? The answers are yes, because they're limitless. Walk it out, live it out. Amen. All right. Then we're going to go to Matthew chapter seven. This is also in the passion translation. We're going to start at verse 21. The word of God says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom or sorry, enter the realm of heaven's kingdom. See, it switches up on you. You got to, you got to read it. You know, will enter into the realm of heaven's kingdom. It is only those who persist. I underlined and highlighted mine It is only those who persist in doing the will of my father. Are you persisting in doing the will of his father, the heavenly father? Now he, he unpacks this a little bit more, but if you wrote anything down, it's that first part of the verse those who persist in doing the will of my father. Verse 22 says, on the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, don't you remember us? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons and do many miracles for the sake of your name? But I will have to say to them, go away from me, you lawless rebels. I've never been joined to you. Now, Pastor Travis likes talking about this. It's, it's that, uh, it's that uh, intimacy uh, with the Lord. It's that abiding, that dwelling, that closeness uh, with Jesus, that drawing together with him intimately. He's saying, I never knew you. I never were, was joined to you in intimate relationships with you. He didn't become one flesh with us. And because of that, you're lawless. You're dead. You're cast into the fire, right? Everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. When the rains fell and the flood came with fierce winds beating upon the house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. But everyone who hears my teaching and does not apply it to his life can be compared to a foolish man who built his house on sand. 
When it rained and rained and the flood came, and with the wind and the waves beating upon its house, it collapsed and was swept away. I, I think about the floods that have been hitting everywhere. The, the tides coming in, water, tons of water coming in and destroying things. People were not ready. They didn't think that it would happen. They didn't think they would see it, right? And they're taking video of it and all marveling at it. And then you have some of the older generation was like, we knew that it could happen. We, we were prepared for it. We, we, we didn't set up camp there. We, we moved up higher on the hill, right? We were, we were prepared, right? And, and I need you to see the, the beginning of what Jesus says here. They were all talking about prophecy and miracles and casting out demons. And, and all of these things have become uh, such big topics in um, the world today. But he said he didn't know them. And so you can preach the best sermon in the world. You can operate in all the power of the Holy Spirit. And you think that this is his sign of approval for you. I'm here to tell you that it's not. Jesus himself said that it was not because we were not joined to him. We weren't abiding in him. Like it's relationship and, and loving him and trusting him and praising him even in the midst of a dangerous storm that comes around you, that that we would have persecution, his word says, but will we still praise? Will we be like the martyr Stephen when when Paul, even standing there, allowing the rest to uh, place their coats at his feet as a, as a sign of him approving of the stoning and killing of Stephen, Stephen still praised God. And Stephen not only praised God through the preaching of the gospel, but he blessed the attackers that were there to kill him and attack him. And and he was with Jesus in glory. Amen. First martyr with Jesus in glory. And he was able to still continue to praise God in the midst of the storm. I want to read Matthew 11, starting in verse 2. So you may think, well, Pastor Chris, I'm, I'm not like them. I'm I'm not like that. I I don't know if I can do that. And I don't know if I have enough faith to persist in all of this craziness. You just don't know what I've been through. And, And as I made reference to Job a minute ago, I can't think of many people that I know personally that have lived a life like Job's, where they've legitimately lost everything and, and are still praising God. But I'm encouraging you that if you do have a life like Job's, or if you have some of the similarities and things that you faced recently, continue to persist like Job, but let's look at a New Testament story. In Matthew 11, verses 2 through 5, it says, When John, this is John the Baptist, a relative of Jesus, Matthew eleven two, When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. You see, even someone as mighty as John, someone as bold as John, had a moment where he was like, gosh, is he the one? Is he the one? Is the one that I I believe and I hope and I trust is the one, but is he? If John can have that moment, so can you and I. But notice that John didn't sin. He he didn't doubt. He didn't beat everybody up and say, I'm in prison and God doesn't love me. God doesn't hear me. No, he wanted to know if you're the one, if you are the one, I'm here and I, I can count it joy to be here because you're the one. It was not for nothing. We can be like James 1 verses two through four says, where it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And then it jumps down to verse 12. And blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. It's your testing. We need the testing. We need the te- the perseverance that comes from testing. We need the character that is formed from that crushing and from that testing. And so if the men and women were all tested throughout the book of Acts and the days of the early church, why would things be different now? It, I have to tell you, it's not. And, and the fact that 
most don't see this. I, I think it's just a testament that we've all become too comfortable with the way that things are. And, and you know, I, I have to ask this question of you. And, and as you examine yourself, you examine your life, can people even tell that you and I are believers in Jesus Christ by the way that we live our lives and by the words that come out of our mouth? Are we like my dad that, you know, when maybe some of the walls and restrictions put in place, you know, what comes out of your mouth is the truest sense of who you are. And he was able to be a a blessing. Can we say the same thing? Are we really God's people? Are we really his sons and daughters? Do we live it? And do we speak it? Do we, do we walk it out for people to see? Is our light shining? All right. We're going to wrap it up in this last section. And I'm going to kind of go through these a little bit quickly, but remember how I said, um, a lot of people will look at Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 8 where it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. Most people will stop there and say, Paul preaches that we're saved by grace through faith. You don't need works. And then James in James 2 says that we need works, right? Well, if you look at Ephesians 2 and verse 10, if you continue that last verse, it says, for we are God's handiwork. We are God's workmanship. Amen. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? Someone say it. Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. For I know the plans, plural, that I have for you. Amen. And so God said, when you take up the... um, the the presence of the Lord Jesus in your life, when you abide in him and Holy Spirit dwells in you, amen? So you abide in him, he abides in us. I've created works for you to do. That's where I said earlier that if you want to be a spear in the hand of the Lord, you got to go and you got to be ready to be thrown, right? And it may not be the person sitting next to you that's about to get thrown. It may just be you, but be ready to be tossed in the hands of the Lord, amen? But he prepared that work for you to do, not somebody else, for you. And so you are saved by grace through faith, not by works. But because you're saved by grace through faith, you will do works for God. Amen? And so I'm not going to read this, but in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, James gives us examples. Like, don't don't tell somebody who's hungry and has no clothes and has nothing um, uh, to their name, be warm, be fed, be safe. If you have the ability to do something about it, don't look to somebody else. Don't look to your pastor. Don't call somebody. It's you. Uh, They came to you because it's you. And and, ah, let me let me get on this. This is another freebie that I I tend to give. But when when you look around your church, I don't know what, what church you go to. Maybe you go to abide. But when you look around your church and you're like, man, I wish there were more people. That pastor needs to get after it and start preaching to the lost. Well, actually, We're all preachers, and God's brought people to your life for you to invite to church and for you to disciple, and you're expecting someone else to complete that task. I'm here to tell you that God is telling you to complete that task, for you to share the gospel with them, for you to invite them into your home and have a meal with them and talk about the Lord, and then invite them to church so they can grow with the community. But they're not coming to get saved. They're not coming to hear a a lovely message by your pastor that is going to transform their life. That may happen, and that has happened throughout the times past. But God is calling each one, every one of us to minister where we've been planted, to scatter that seed, and to watch God create the harvest. And so if you are thinking that, you need to repent and say, God, forgive me. Help me to get back to the work of preaching your gospel and creating disciples, because that was something he commanded all of us to do, not just your pastor. Amen? All right. I want to finish with a prophetic encouragement, but uh, two scriptures that I did not give our team. And they are found in Revelation 22, both of them. But it's a um, promise that Jesus will reward each one of us according to our deeds and our works. Verse 7, Revelation 22, 7 says, Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Revelation 22 and 12, he says, Look, so he, he's, he's causing us to remember that he's coming. Look, I'm coming soon. And this is verse 12, so 7 and 12. My reward is with me, 
and I will give to each person according to what they've done. So y'all better not tell me that like Paul and James and now Jesus is saying that you don't have to do any work, that you don't have to do anything. You, you just, you know, you're, you're just chilling, you're saved and everything is good. No, because you're saved, because he's loved you, because he's taken care of you, you are going to do good works and you will receive a reward based on what it is that you've done. Amen. I received this prophetic word um, uh, one of the posts or books or something that I was following. And as I was preparing this message, the Lord highlighted it to me again. And I want to close our time with this just as an encouragement. This is from Al Mansfield. And he said, just over a year ago, I was praying. I was very concerned about some things in the church, in our country, and in the world. I admit that I was feeling somewhat discouraged and lacking in faith and hope. And to that I say, amen. So have I. Then he was surprised to sense that the Lord was speaking a word to his heart. The following is what he heard. Listen to this. Am I not the Lord God of all flesh? Are not the times and seasons in my hands? Do not the skies and the waters and the earth obey my command? Is anything too difficult for me, says the Lord? You mourn and weep over my body, the church. But do not mourn and weep as those who have no faith. You grieve over my body, the church, but do not grieve as those who have no hope. I say to you, look to who I am, says the Lord. Keep faith with me and in me. Let your faith rise when all else would pull you down. Let your faith neither falter nor fail, for your faith is in a living God. Your faith is in an all-knowing and all-wise God. Your faith is in an all-powerful God. Your faith is in an all-loving God. I am never shocked. I'm never surprised. I'm never caught off guard. And I'm never unprepared, says the Lord. In me are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Take hold of me by faith and let your faith rise. Let your faith rise. Let your faith rise. I am the victor, says the Lord. So keep faith with my victory. Rejoice in my victory, and your faith will be your victory as well. Amen? For my Holy Spirit is strong. My Holy Spirit is fierce. My Holy Spirit is tenacious. My Holy Spirit is zealous for my glory. My Holy Spirit is not mocked, and do not grieve my Holy Spirit. Do not grieve or anger the Lord God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Yield to my Holy Spirit, says the Lord, and let your faith rise up. I think one of the greatest ways that we bless the Lord is by doing exactly that, trusting in who he is and letting our faith rise up. Amen. And so I want to leave you with a final scripture. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 5. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit, that is Holy Spirit, as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident. Someone say, I am always confident, always confident, and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith and not by sight. Y'all, today, somebody needs to hear that. We live by faith and not by sight. And so though your circumstances, though the storms all around you may have come in and, and to the outside, it may not look like things are perfect. Things are that great. They, they may be totally terrible on the outside. But if your heart is one that is filled with the Holy Spirit and you're operating and producing the fruit of love and all of its expressions, you can truly be blessed on this side in the midst of any trial or or tribulation that you can sing this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine can you sing that can you declare that or um, another uh, song that I was thinking about as I wrote this and I I didn't intend to go there but um, um, there's an old Amy Grant song that mom used to listen to all the time but uh, the it come from a psalm of course but uh, thy word O God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path are we turning to him, the word, the living word, Jesus Christ, and letting him illuminate the path before us and trusting in him? Just as the disciples were in the middle of that raging storm and they were like, how can he sleep? 
I want to be the one that's with Jesus as he's napping in the boat in the midst of all the storms. And all he had to do is wake up and say, what's going on? Peace be still. And they're like, who is he that even the winds and the waves obey him? Right? The winds and the waves in your life obey the voice of the master. Why? Because it knows the voice of the one that is speaking. And you and I can be little echoes of that echoing his voice, echoing his command, echoing his authority everywhere that we go. And so I encourage you to walk out your faith. Now, if you're watching this today and you're like, man, Pastor Chris, I don't know you. I don't know Abide. I, I most definitely don't know the Jesus you're speaking of. I, in, I invite you. Someone told me one time, they said, um, why? I was talking to my you know, family member and I asked him, he, he waited till the end of his life to accept Jesus. He said, why did you wait so long? He said, no one invited me personally. And so person, I'm inviting you. My name is Chris and I invite you. Will you accept the name of the Lord Jesus and will you walk with him and let him be the Lord and master of your life? The word of God says that if you accept him, he will draw near to you. He will come live in you and he will teach you and guide you in his ways. If you want to accept Jesus Christ today, all you have to do is say, Jesus, I know and I believe that I am a sinner, but I believe and know that you died on the cross for me, that you were buried but then you resurrected and you're now in heaven making intercession for me. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me for my sins and to come live in my heart. If you believe that as you spoke that out, we declare right now, according to scripture, that just as it said, if you declare and confess with your mouth and your heart that he is Lord and you want him to be Lord and master of your life, then he will do exactly that right here right now. And I am to welcome you into the family of God. I bless you. I welcome you to Jesus' family. Connect with me. Connect with the church. Connect with somebody that is walking out this Jesus lifestyle that is abiding in Jesus as we do here at Abide. John 15, 5 says, we will abide in him and he will abide in us. And apart from him, we can do nothing. And so if you would like a Bible, if you would like prayer, if you would just like to to connect with this family, would you send us a message and let us know that you accepted Jesus into your heart today? We would love to join with you, get you some free resources, and just, you know, once again, welcome you more firmly, more um, consistently into God's family. I bless you. Once again, I, uh, I mentioned before that we have some events coming up. One of the first things that I want to remind you of is on Friday nights at 6 p.m. we have prayer where we all gather together and we pray for the needs of the community, of the nation, and everything else. And then normally we would go into our brand new altar gatherings. We call it the altar because Jesus said he wanted us to repair and rebuild and get back to his altar. And so that's why it's called the altar. It's a little bit different than a regular church service, but um, but it's very powerful and we're just having a beautiful time learning from the Lord. But this Friday specifically, we have a special night and it's going to be called Embers. It's the Embers Conference, and it's going to be with my friend, um, Alex Parkinson. Um, He is coming to us from uh, the Carolinas, and he's going to come to Oklahoma, and he's going to be in Oklahoma City on January 19th and 20th. We're going to be here at Abide, and it's going to be Friday at 6.30 and Saturday at 6.30. And so uh, we encourage you to come and join us for these two powerful nights of uh, preaching, teaching, worship, etc. It's going to be an awesome time. Miracles, signs, and wonders are sure to break out. And so come expecting a miracle, come expecting a healing, whatever it is you come for, declare it to be so in the spirit and then watch it happen. And then Sunday, the 21st, we will not have an in-person gathering. And so no abide gathering on Sunday, January 21st. And so join us on the 19th and 20th for our Embers Conference. I pray this has blessed you. Last but not least, I'm going to pray a blessing over you and over your gifts. If you are um, a member of the church and you're giving your regular tithe, or if you're somebody who's just come across this 
uh, teaching and it's blessed you, we pray that you ask the Lord if he would have you give an offering as a way to sow a seed into the work of this ministry. And we thank you for that. So Lord God, I pray a blessing on these people as they give in obedience to you. You said, bring our tithes, our offerings, our gifts to your storehouse and watch what you do with it, Lord God. And so that you would use this for your kingdom and for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. There are a number of ways to give. You can give online at abideokc.com. Uh, you can give in the app. <coughs> and you can also, excuse me, <clears throat> you can also give in cash app at dollar sign abide OKC. If this message blessed you, we pray that you would share it with somebody, bless them as well. And we look forward to seeing you at our Embers Conference, January 19th, Friday at 630. Bless you guys and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.